Um, and I left TGI Fridays, I guess that's been about seven years, six, seven years ago now. Let's see, it's, um, you do, there are occasions where you cut people off, but it's a little less often than in a bar or restaurant. You do not get a lot of visits from alcohol law enforcement and banquet bartending. Not like you do when you manage a restaurant, especially a busy restaurant that might have a big crowd on a Friday or Saturday night. So that's one of the, you know, it's great because you're, you know, you're usually at events where people are happy. You know, it's a conference. They get to go spend their boss's money to stay in a hotel and go out of town. It's a wedding. Someone's getting married. Um, there just there are a lot of reasons why it's it's, it's fun work, and it's the, it's the reason I'm doing it. You know, all these years later. Um, make sure I didn't miss anything, guys. Okay, and bartenders are special. There are things about the job as a bartender that don't apply to anybody else in the room. A bartender who does their job wrong can get arrested. People, that's not going to happen most of the time to a waiter or waitress. So there is an additional level of responsibility that goes with that. It's easier for bartenders, and this, is, this applies a little more to the restaurant side than the banquet side. But it's easier, but I'm going to mention this in case you end up working in food service in a re re more regular restaurant situation. It's easier for bartenders to steal than any other employee in the restaurant. In most restaurants, it's carefully set up to make it hard to steal. A waiter or waitress can't give you a free meal, not ring it into the computer, and then take, tell you what you owe and pocket the money because they can't get the food from the kitchen until they punch it into the computer in most places. And that's intentionally to keep that from being a possibility. You know, they can't slip you an extra, they can't get a drink from the bar until most bars, most chain restaurants especially, until that ticket shows up in the printer and the bartender says, oh, I need to make another gin and tonic for Melissa to take the table 32. So the bartender's different though, because the bartender in most places has access to the money and the product. Like I said, the waiters, the kicks, they only have access to one or the other, so they can't give it away. But so that's why a lot of restaurant chains, and people ask me this all the time, oh, how do I, you know, like when I manage for Friday, sometimes I get a phone call. Oh, I want to think about going to bartending school, especially, you know, those things where they charge thousands of dollars and you want to go for two or three weeks or every weekend for eight months or whatever. You know, I said, you know, if you really want to bartend in that kind of restaurant, the thing to do is to go get yourself a job there as a waiter or waitress. And then every chance you get, say to the bartenders, I want to learn something, I want to learn something, I want to learn something. Um, because they want in a chain restaurant like that, or even a, even a, even not necessarily a chain, but any sit-down table service kind of restaurant with a full bar, they want people they can trust behind the bar. That is a huge thing to them, and that comes with knowing you for a bit of time. I mean, there are times where by necessity they hire from outside, but it doesn't always. It's not their first choice. Um, all right, so that's why bartenders are special. Oh, and that is another thing we talked about being in the room all the time. And I do this a lot, and I like this, and I like people, but sometimes you are always on. You are here, you are in front of the people, uh, typically a wedding, five hours. I may run to the back to grab some stuff for five minutes here, five minutes there. I may take a bathroom break. Uh, at one of my jobs, they routinely rotate me out for 15 or 20 minutes to eat at one point in the evening. But unlike waiters and waitresses, who are probably in the room in front of the guest 20% of the time, 25% of the time, they all run off to the back, they're polishing silverware, they're getting ready for the next thing. We are out there. And that, I find, I don't that'll apply to you, I find that's a little more emotionally taxing. I mean, at the end of the night, I'm a little worn out from taking care of people. And I love it. But it's another thing that makes the job do. Um, all right, glasses are here. <laughs> yep, glasses are here, so. Um, and they're on wheels, because I got yes. the wheel sign. Yeah. Did, hey, did, do we have a table off the wheel on table? Um, I, I have one I, if we don't. Okay, well, okay. if you have one, that's great. But yeah, I've got the glassware, and I've got some handouts, or whatever you want to do. All right, well, uh, jump into the glass. Which handouts are those? Have to go? I don't know who's here, but yes. Okay. Let's say, let's say yes. All right, we're going to sit. And most, in most venues, they let you do that. You know, sometimes a specific venue may have specific rules that they want you to follow along, but the rules have to be within the law. Um, of course, we all know, I hope, that you can't serve alcohol to anybody under 21. And you always need to know what it's on, what year that, that would be. Right. Take a second, you punch in this year's date on your phone, get the calculator mode app out, you subtract 21, 
They have to be going on or before this date in that year. So um, let's, yeah, let's do it now. How old, what year, what year do they have to be to drink now? Somebody do it for me, somebody do yeah. it for me. 19 what? He didn't use his calculator. That was the problem. <laughs> 98. Okay. Um, Do we all agree? On your okay. okay. Um, so you need to know that. Um, I do it on my phone. I do it on my phone all the time before I start an event, just to make sure it's in my head right. Yep. But can a parent get a drink for a child? Well, yeah, that is going to be our next question. Mm -hmm. Man, I had a topic. Um, a child? 1998. It is illegal to serve anybody under the age of 21. If mom or dad comes up and says, oh, we drink, she drinks wine at home all the time, I need a glass. No, that's not legal. <laughs> you cannot do that. Um, now, if that parent takes a glass, and I'm never gonna make it easy for them. If that parent wants to take that glass of wine and slide it over, you know, in a wedge, I might not chase them down. And when I worked in a chain restaurant, absolutely. We went to the table and said, we need to see this person's ID, this drink is in front of, in front of. and if they did not have the ID, if the drink was off the table, and if they did it again, the drinks were all, all the drinks were off the table because that was you're putting your liquor license at risk. I mean, a business pays a lot of money to have a liquor license, and you know if you break the law, the ABC people come, the alcohol law enforcement, and they take your liquor license away. Usually, they start by taking it away for a Friday, Saturday, and a Sunday. They okay, well, this weekend you aren't going to be absurd liquor. Let me tell you what: you run a restaurant or a bar, and your guests show up on a Friday night and you can't serve liquor, that's gonna put a big hurting on your profits for that weekend. So that is a serious thing. So you can't serve underage. Um, you can't serve, you know, usually in banquet stuff, what time you start in the morning doesn't really come into play. I think weekdays at 6 a.m. But you can't serve past 2 a.m. We don't get into a lot of situations in banquets where bars are going that late. But by law, you cannot serve drinks past 2 in the morning. On Sunday morning, you cannot serve drinks before they just changed that law. It used to be you couldn't serve drinks on Sunday morning before noon. So sometimes that came into play, you know, like you had a brunch thing. And again, on the night it goes to two in the morning. Um, and I will say this, because this might come up since we work here on campus, that applies to businesses that have a liquor license. Um, if you are in your private home and you want to have a drink at nine o'clock on Sunday morning, the law does not say you can't drink at home on Sunday morning. Uh, and if you have friends over, they can drink on Sunday morning. And the reason we're bringing this up is because sometimes I, mean, I do a lot of bartending for the chancellor here at North Carolina State. Because he does not have a liquor license. They just go down to the store and buy the liquor like you would for your house. So that is a thing that sometimes comes up. Technically, the laws all still apply. Um, think about it. Because sometimes people are like, oh, well, it's my private house. It yeah. shouldn't matter what I do at home. Well, let's take, the, let's take that example out. Oh, I'm at home. I'm going to murder somebody, you know. Well, it's not legal because you did it at your home. So why would any other law not apply because it was in your home? The laws are there to protect society as a whole. So yeah, you, you know, just because it's at somebody's house, you can't serve the 18-year-olds. You get hired for a party and then all of a sudden mom or dad are like, oh, well, we're gonna let the 18-year-olds drink beer. They can't have the hard liquor. Well, I'm, no, I'm sorry, I cannot legally do that. Um, and in fact, I really encourage people, if you get a private party like that, now, and I do some, I do a fair number of those, um, sometimes though, depending on what the circumstances are, I call Shakira up and I'm like, Shakira, I guess a private party I want, I'm going to do, I want, I'm going to put people in touch with you and I'm going to let them hire me through STSS. Right. Well, I, I'm still responsible, but you there's some insurance now. Yeah. Yeah. Liability. Liability insurance is there. And plus two, then I also don't have to worry about them paying, you know, because they're going to make them pay with a credit card ahead of time. It takes some, takes some complication out of it. Sometimes I'm talking to somebody about a private party and the venue they're using. Like I did something out for the uh, one of the board of realtors out in, and they have an office out in Cary that actually has an event space built into it. And they need and that way you guys will have, you know, a record of your hiring an agency. And that and that's actually let's that, that's a little bit of a tangent, but sometimes you see somebody say certified bartender. Now, when you get done with this class, we're gonna give you a certificate, right? Okay, all right, we're working on those details. But under the laws in say North Carolina, there's no such thing as bartender certification. I mean, not saying somebody can't have a certificate from a bartender school, but it is in no way recognized by the law in North Carolina. 
There's no such thing as a licensed bartender in North Carolina. Um, there are businesses that say, oh, we have a training program we want you to do, and there are some outside training programs, responsible alcohol sales. The State of North Carolina Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission certifies the training presented to Thomas S. Humphrey for the Responsible Alcohol Seller Program. There you are, RASP. So the state does run a program that doesn't cost you anything to go to. And it's funny how, mis how common that misconception is. I was doing an event at one of the Fred Fletcher Park downtown. They had to fill out a form ahead of time for the alcohol permit. And it said, well, you have a licensed bartender. And I'm like, and, and then I look and I see at the bottom of the form, it says it's been written by a lawyer who works for the county or the city. And I'm like, really? They don't have any more sense than that? Um, and, but it was funny, so we just said, no, we don't have a licensed bartender. But then they didn't say anything else about that, so we were good. Um, a lot of people think that is a thing, you know, and it's not. Um, what about the permits? Yes, and that, and that is a good thing. If you are in a business that serves alcohol and regulates, they have an ABC license. Uh, they have a whole, they actually have four different ones usually. Wine, beer, fortified wine, and liquor. And in fact, this is funny, fortified wine, we'll delve in this a little later, is stuff like vermouth and port, where it's wine that they've actually added some alcohol to, um, to make it a little stronger. Usually more about the flavor than the strength, but it does, they, for some reason, along the way, they've decided this has a separate permit. I knew a guy who was managing a restaurant, and they had never gotten a fortified wine permit, because they had just said, oh, well, we don't want to spend an extra, uh, $300 a year on that permit, we don't really need it. And then they went and called their supplier up and said, oh, we need to order vermouth for our bar to make it. Then you would if you just walked in the store. Because you pay the same price that you would go and pay at the store, plus the extra mixed beverage tax on it. So that is one of the reasons that the ABC people have a rule against pouring butt liquor from one bottle to another. It's against technically it's the law to do that. It's not gonna say it doesn't happen. A lot of times at the end of the night, the manager wants to have fewer bottles to put up. But it is actually illegal. Um, I say, having said that, I do it discreetly all the time because it's about kind of keeping stuff neat. But don't do that unless the manager tells you to. And then so do, then if you do it, don't do it where anyone can see you. Can see you. Um, but so if you walk into a place that has a liquor license, like a bar or a club, and you start seeing bottles of liquor without the sticker on it, there is some serious monkey business going on. Uh, on that one, aren't you? Yeah, see that? Yeah. Pass that around. Where is it? See that where it's black? See where I took that marker and scribbled it out? Sticker, it says it so he runs over a lady in a crosswalk and she breaks her leg and you know she needs massive surgery and lifetime care. You know, then that could be an issue. So that's one of the reasons we want to be responsible about that. The Friday's rule was no more than three drinks an hour. You know, and, and you know, and five all day. That's a pretty good threshold rule. You know, a smaller person, smaller body, less body mass, they're gonna drink faster, you know, they're gonna get drunk faster. You know, there are a lot of people who don't feel drunk, but if you put a breathalyzer in their mouth, you know, if I've, if I've had three mixed drinks in an hour, there are guys who I know who, you know, they would, that wouldn't even phase them. But I guarantee you, if they get a breathalyzer, they're gonna fail. You know, so that's the thing, you have to help people manage their own expectations. Because, you know, if somebody goes to a wedding, you know, it's not uncommon for a wedding to have six or seven or eight drinks in the course of a four or five hour reception. And yeah, that would put them over the limit. So you just have to be responsible about that. Um, oh, and this is a good thing to note. Um, there's no law that says you can't serve a pregnant woman. You know, there are a lot of people think, oh, she's pregnant, she shouldn't be drinking. Hey, that is her own decision to make. That's kind of like smoking. You know, people are adults. If they want to smoke, that's fine. I'm not going to try and stop you from smoking. I think it's a bad idea. But the same thing. So if someone comes up to you who is pregnant and says, I want to drink make them a drink. You know, that is not your place to enforce morality on them. Well, there's so much we can talk about there. So, you got to see their ID. We talked, we talked, we hit us, we started on it because we were talking about what years were born. Before this, to that, on or before this day in 1998 is our current date. I card people. You, you need to card people if they look too young. You know, now like a lot of supermarkets have a sign up and say, hey, we card anyone under 40 or whatever. Um, I don't think you have to be there. But you do need to, you, and then sometimes just carding a few people is enough. You know, it kind of sends the message. Oh, you know, especially at the start of a party. Like, especially if it's a party and you think there are a lot of young people there. And sometimes I ask that question when I'm doing a wedding. I'll say to my boss or somebody in the wedding party, you know, we're talking to Edna. Do 
do you know how old the bride and groom are? Because, you know, odds are if the bride and groom are 31, most of their friends are within a couple of years. But when I hear the bride and groom are 23 or 24 or 25, I'm like, nah, you gotta walk, you gotta be more careful. Um, this is an important part of the law in North Carolina. If you ask somebody for their ID and they do not show you an ID, you are not allowed to serve them. So I know a lot of bartenders who like to make a joke out of, oh, Aunt Edna's 80 years old and asking for her ID. But legally, if, Aunt Edna, if you make that joke and Aunt Edna doesn't have her ID with her because she quit driving 10 years ago because she couldn't see anymore, you legally can't serve her. So I don't try not to do that joke. You know, I, you know, there are a lot of people who think that's cool, you know, these neat, neat little bit of, you know, making women feel better about their age by pretending to card them. That's kind of old hat, you know? So don't, you know, don't ask people for their ID unless you really think you need to. But if you do, ask them for their ID. Now, this happened to be the other one. This was a while back. Girl whips out her phone, picks up her phone, shows me a picture of her passport. I'm like, what? She goes, my passport. I showed her to get into the party. I'm like, ma'am, that I can't serve you. That is not your ID. That is a picture of your ID. That doesn't count. And you know, in this day and age, you'll probably only see more of that. You need to see a driver's license or a state issued ID card. Or what's the one other really good ID that you may see? Passport. Um, and, and we see that a lot here in Raleigh because we have, especially here around the university, because we have so many foreign students. And they, when they come to the United States, they don't necessarily get a U.S. driver's license, but they have to have a passport. Man, if you go down to the food line on Western Boulevard, every other person buying beer whips out a passport for their ID. I mean, it's just amazing how many passports you see going through the checkout line down there. But it has to be the real thing. Um, so you so, can't take passports. Absolutely. Passport is, yeah, that passport's about the most secure thing there is. I mean, that's probably better than a driver's license. A little harder to put in your wallet, but that's not what you got. So in that scenario is more like within a wedding environment, right? So what? if it's like a banquet here, uh -huh. you don't need to... Oh, no, if you're not sure about their age? Okay. Because it's when you're doing a banquet here, a lot of banquets here may have students it's invited it's to them. Right. right. So, yeah, if you're, no, no, you, in fact, People here, man, sometimes at a wedding, people are like, oh, I didn't bring my idea, I didn't know, you know, or oh, I gotta have my husband run back out of the car, I left it. Because, like, especially with a bridal party, especially the women, they don't necessarily have dresses where they can carry their ID with them. Um, so, so, so that, I'm careful also about asking those people, you know, because I don't want to not let them get a drink at the wedding. But if they're really young, sometimes I say, I'm sorry, I gotta have you go get it for me. Um, but no, here all the time, in fact, all the time the staff people run at events, like even the chancellor will say, oh, you know, we got a few young people here tonight, make sure you check their IDs, uh, or someone from his office. All right, so, so any other questions right now? I think, is there anything else law-wise anybody has any questions? If it's expired, it doesn't matter. No, it can't be expired, it has to be current. Well, it changed about a year, year and a half back. It used to be you could not serve alcohol on Sunday until after 12 noon, okay. and now you can serve it after 10 a.m. Yeah, they call that the brunch bill because the restaurants are really happy that they can uh, that they can serve alcohol. And again, you're going to run into a lot of that. The, the biggest thing is they slow you down a little teeny bit because all of a sudden you go, it's not one you're used to looking at. And of course, the North Carolina ones are nice now. They say under 21 until such and such a date, which is really convenient. Horizontal. Yeah, they, if, horizontal. if they got them when they were under 21, they've turned a, a yeah, horizontal. So and if they're, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing is. Um, but out of state, and especially here at the university, you're gonna see a lot of out of state, because again, students don't necessarily get a local driver's license if they're coming for a couple of years, you know, to, to come to school. All right, so the big third part of being a bartender, we talked about the, the hospitality and the service, is what I call the production. That's the actual process of making and getting the drinks out there. And so that's what we're gonna talk about now. Um, we're gonna start with these glasses because there are the two most important things to a bartender, in my opinion, are glasses and ice. Because if you run out of either one of those, if you run out of liquor, you can go get another bottle of liquor, that's easy. Beer a little harder, depends on whether it's cold. But when you run out of liquor, or when you run out of glasses and ice, those are both things that are complicated things to get. You gotta get something to carry it in, you gotta get it from the back. Um, glasses, especially if you're going through a lot of glasses. I mean, you might, if you do a liquor bar with liquor drinks, I mean, it's possible that you're gonna use you know, you got 150 people at it, you're doing it for five hours. I mean, you go through hundreds and hundreds of glasses. So I will, I don't mind running and getting some more stuff. I don't want to overstock everything so much that I'm putting up a bunch of stuff at the end of the night. But I also 
don't want to have to scramble too much to get more things I need. If somebody comes up and wants something to drink, I don't ever want to say the only options are alcohol. That's just kind of a bad bartender bad business. You want to always be able to at least give them a glass of water. So anyway, so you're going to have beer and wine here at this table. So let's say um, it's going to be a little small party. We're not going to have a lot of people. So this is one, something they use over the state club. We use some of those at the chancellor's house. This is one from here, the world's smallest wine glass, uh, the one they use here at Tally. That one is not very clean. That is from the Garden of Millbrook. Um, so the, you, they take different shapes. That's just the thing. It's so, so just be prepared, you know, depending on where you are, you might get something different. And they look almost, if you look at them apart, you know, oh, they look the same. But you put them side by side, and there's a big difference. So, um, you're going to set up your wine glasses on the table. So, usually when we set wine glasses, glasses up on the table, you're going to want to turn them face down. Because you do not want, you want to be able to look down and tell which ones are clean and which ones are dirty. And you want to make an attractive setup. up wine glasses. For a thing that's an hour or an hour or two. Yeah, you because know, you figure some people are going to drink beer anyway. And so, when you, yeah, you always ask. And, I, and I'm going to put them on a the table. Some people come and do it like this. There's no reason to waste that space between them. Have them touch so, each yeah, other. So yeah, Thomas, maybe let someone else. Let's say this, just so you're aware of this. Um, it's harder to see. It's easier to see against the black. Do you see how that one glass is kind of white, whitish, milky colored? Mm -hmm. That is a permanent stain on the glass. Hey, what? I'll have a whole bunch of crap out of there. Yeah, you would see. There you go. I was trying to think of um, Rizzo. You're doing Rizzo. I was trying to think of the name Rizzo. Um, this black tablecloth right here, if you put this right there and you flip there into the nice and it'll work just fine. So let's get some beer. Here's our. They're kind of grouped together. All right, that's all the beer we've got for this particular bar. Thirsty, we usually use, they have some silver bowls. It will get it all the way red. But if shortly after you crush it, you pull those skins out, only a little bit of the color is in. Um, so anyway, that is White Zimmendel. Um, the new blushes are not as sweet. They're very popular in the summer. Great way to twirl napkins. Ooh. People they think that is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> they really would like, when you recycle, for there not to be a trash bag in the can. They would like the bottles and stuff to go straight in the can, so then it can dumped straight into the recycling big bin without any plastic bags getting in the way. The university is pretty big on recycling. I will say this, sometimes the actual university employees who are involved, not so big on recycling. When we, oh, by the way, you always want to find some towels too, because we're, we're, we're gonna um, time check real quick. This is a North Carolina beer, Red Oak, made up the road in Winslet, just outside of Greensboro. So this beer in the bottle has to stay refrigerated. If you leave it out, like a case of Budweiser in your storeroom, you're going to come back and this beer is going to have gone bad. The best example of that is like, think of like you make some chicken soup. If you buy Campbell's chicken soup in a can, you can sit that in your cabinet for a month, or six months, or a year, or whatever, and it's still going to be good when you eat, open it. But if you make a fresh batch of chicken soup on the stove, you know, you can put it in the fridge, but it's only been good for four or five days before it's going to start to go bad because it's not been pasteurized. So anyway, that is the big difference in draft, and it, and it affects the taste. So, a couple of things we want to talk about here. In a minute, we're going to talk about how to actually serve draft. A lot of times, at the end of the night, you're going to pack it up and put it up. Sometimes, it will have been cold, and it's going to get warm again. In a perfect world, you would keep beer cold once it got cold. But let me tell you what, I do a lot of banquet work. Sometimes, because of storage space considerations, or because of the way the people are going to take it to, it's going to just have to get warm. So that was the other thing we wanted to say, is we talked about the fact you never throw away boxes until you're completely done packing up. Play in a storeroom, something like that, don't get rid of your boxes until you're done. And if you don't end up using them all for beer, you know, you may very well have to, um, maybe the people going home from the wedding or have floral flowers they want to take with them. And you say, oh, sure, here's a new box, you can use that, you know? Again, that is something you just kind of have to know. I'm trying to see what this bottle says about keeping it refrigerated. 
It does say unpasteurized on the label. There are not a lot of beers like that, but you do need to be aware that there are some out there. Okay, so if it, it doesn't matter if it's a can or a bottle, if it says unpasteurized, then it needs to be, be refrigerated. refrigerated. And I don't know, off the top of my head, I don't know of anyone who's doing an unpasteurized beer and putting it in a can. What does what pasteurized mean? Heat he treated with heat to kill the bacteria. Oh, it's heated it up. Yes. Oh. Not, not just heated up, but heated hot enough to kill any bacteria that might be present. Oh, before it was packaged. Pasteurized, yes. refrigerated, unpasteurized is. No, pasteurized is. Does not have to be refrigerated. Does not have to be yes. refrigerated. So your party is really hopping, you're going through a lot of beer. How long is it going to take you to get more beer cold? In a pinch, oh, in a pinch, you can might get away with 10 if you have enough ice and ore. It, it won't be super cold, but it won't be too hot to drink. I mean, ideally, you want to serve beer at about 34 degrees. Um, another thing I'm going to say is when you pick a beer up like this, it's been sitting in a bin up like this, especially if you don't have a ton of ice in it. You feel down here? This is nice and cold. You feel this top? This is still pretty warm. I've been up here and you're serving okay. from. Okay. Yeah, and then we keep the other ones uh -huh. on the bottom. We are going ice and. See, now I might not even go to that much trouble. I might just have, you can just do display beers up here. And if the tubs are easy to get to, you know, just go down here. In fact, if I had a liquor bar, you know, I would need all this space for the liquor set up. My beer tubs would definitely either be behind me or on the floor behind me, you know. But and then another nice thing, and let's see, everyone's, everyone, I hate to make everyone get back up after they got settled down, but it's going to be hard for you guys to see this from where you're sitting. And this is, this is not one of those you got to do things. This is one of those things that just impresses people. You pick that beer up and you put it down on that napkin and you roll that napkin. Yeah. Another thing, so if you don't have that, you can wrap it in the napkin. Um, but if you don't, have, service. you don't have the napkin, at the very least you're going to do is you're going to take a towel and kind of get some of that water off. So you're not handing the guy in the suit and tie or the woman in the pretty dress the dripping wet beer. Now, let me ask you this question. How are you going to open that beer? Because that's an important part. First of all, you never give somebody a beer that's not open. Someone's, I did not say that. I said you might have a trash can down here, you're throwing them in. Oh, 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 I you know what? No, no, you know what? I was talking about liquor bottles and wine corks oh, for okay. at the end of the night if we need to seal them back up. Oh. Beer tops, occasionally you show some place where they want you to save the caps because they want to count them at the end of the night to right. make sure we use the right number of beers, but that doesn't happen a lot. Okay. Are very, I like one of these. Now there are some different kinds, you know, like here's one that you can do with the back, this is a can punch with the back end will open a beer, but I, when I'm bartending, the two things that come out of my bag every time I'm bartending is one of these and a corkscrew. And I, and I have a particular one I like better than the others. Because I'm going to tell you what, even if it's a twist off, if you sit here and you open, you have a big event and you open 100 or 200 beers by the end of the night, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now your hands a little torn up. Right. You know, and there's some people, oh, well, I'll just use a cocktail napkin. Well, you better throw a lot of cocktail napkins. That's just a bunch more trash. So I use a beer bottle opener like that. Does the trick. Now, I made a list of notes. All right, so we've talked a little about recycling. You want to have a bin back here so you can keep the recycling separate. A good trick if you have a really, really busy bar and you're having to bring out a lot of beer to restock is to actually keep the box, empty box for the wine and the beer under the bar and you can actually put bottles back in the box. And then at the end of the night, that's really easy. You just stack those up and take them down to recycling. So don't do that at every bar. It doesn't make a lot of sense if you're not using a lot of stuff, but like if you're going through, I've done weddings where I go through 18 cases of beer in five hours. That would be a lot of trash cans going out to get emptied, you know, full of recycling. And you know, you pull that recycling bag out and it's got all those bottles in it. It's awkward, it rattles, it's noisy. That box I can pick up, it doesn't make a sound. I can take it out the side door and put it in the dumpster. Um, all right, so we talked about recycling. So we talked about how to serve the beer. We want it to be wrapped up or dried off. Um, we do need to talk a little bit, and this is going to be one of those things, there's no way we can completely cover the sopping and pressure in the keg. Yeah, there's some pressure in the keg. I mean, it's the dregs that have been sitting in the keg. Okay. Um, but the thing I want to say, so you see how that opens up. You, when it comes to draft beer, draft beer can be really foamy. It just depends on how the keg has been handled before it gets to you. There's not a lot you can do about that if it's coming out foamy, especially with a hand pump. Because uh, if you don't pump some after a few minutes, you know, you hold this in there and you run it, you know, you stop, you aren't pumping, you're going to start getting less pressure, the beer's not going to come out as fast, and that's when you know you got to pump some more. So can you, 
Well, the, it, it's the beer will not come out of the keg if you don't keep pumping. No, okay. I made a mistake one time when the was for the foods. If you pump it too much, then you know foam out. It can be foamier, but that's usually not the biggest cause of foam. The biggest cause of foam is usually that the keg got really jostled around ahead of time. And the other thing I want to say is so sometimes when it's really foamy, what you see people do is say like, oh, I'm going to only squeeze that a little bit and let a little beer out. That's straight foam. That makes it foamier. Because what you're doing is, is it's like opening, a, if you've got a faucet and you've got a valve in there that opens up, you're like open it just a little teeny bit and all the beer in there is trying to squeeze around it and it sprays harder and it makes more foam. I'm here without some pitchers. <clears throat> you may have draft beer that's working perfectly fine and you can fill a glass up, but literally nine times out of ten, it is much easier to fill this pitcher up and then pour this pitcher in a glass. And you can, what you can do is when some, you don't have a customer, you keep your pitcher filled up, then the customer shows up, pour super easy. Do we start with chill because there's no ice? Yes. Hang on one second. We'll get right back to that. Remind me. So if you're doing a glass from the pitcher, you want to do the 45 degree angle thing because that will help keep the foam down. Um, yes, draft beer should always be served cold because it has to stay refrigerated. I will say this, if you're doing a party for two hours or even an hour, especially an hour, now if you're outside and it's 95 degrees, you need to have some ice around this keg. Now if you're inside and you're only going to be serving the beer for a couple hours, it might not be so important to have a lot of ice. You might put a little ice around it just to help keep it cold. but because this was already cold when it came to you from the refrigerator, it's got, and you're only going to be serving for a couple hours, it's, if it's a five hour wedding, definitely, you got to have ice. But if it's something here at the university where it's just for a couple hours, maybe you just put a little ice around it. Um, a lot of times you're going to need to have it in some kind of container to keep it. You really always want to have it in a bucket or a cooler or a rolling cart or something because even if you don't have a lot of ice around it, a lot of times, you know, it, it, it might leak there sometimes, the seal's not good, or, you know, the hose might just dribble, you know, you're going to just put it at your bar. That's a good question. Yeah. All right, well, now, I would, if I were setting this bar up, I would try to get an extra cooler, and I would probably put it down here where my beer glasses are, so I'd put it in an extra cooler right here where I'd get to it. Now, all right, now you, now you twist. Twist. You can use the handle to twist. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. that Let's one. See, yeah, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, so it is for cast. Yeah. And how do you just pop it off? Yeah, yeah, just snaps right off. Okay, yeah, push it. There you go. All right. Hey, it makes more sense now, doesn't it? Yeah. All right, Arthur, step up. You tap the keg. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> Like what was that? I didn't go all the way. The beer comes out from the bottom. There's a tube that's connected to this fitting at the top. There's a tube that goes all the way to the bottom. The beer comes out from the bottom because that's where the coldest beer is. How often do you just When you're sitting here and you're filling up a pitcher or you're filling up a glass, you're, you're, you're holding that tap. Just That's one of the awkward things about a hand pump is you've you got all your hands kind of full there. Um, sometimes, and, and again, do that 45 degree angle thing. Do the pitcher with you doing the pitcher. You know, sometimes if you don't have a hand free because you're trying to pump too, you know, I'll have it pointed at the side of the thing so it's not running down. Yeah, sometimes you. Well, if you're busy, yes. Um, so find yourself a corkscrew. They don't have to be especially expensive. Um, let's talk about the different styles. This is a wing type corkscrew. I hate them. Um, we have a few people who use them because. So for some people who might have a mobility issue, they're easier to use. But the problem with these is, well, first off, you can carry that with you. It doesn't fit in your pocket very good. Second of all, the only way to use this is on a table. You have to sit the bottle down to use this. When I'm opening a regular cork with my cork bottle opener, it never touches the table.